Back at it, hour number two here on the early line, Series XM Channel 159 on the Sports Grid Network. Donnie Wrightside and Kevin Walsh. A lot of topics already covered, but as we started, I thought we had this handled in the seven and seven. There was a time, Kevin, where we would do hour number two and open up with the seven and seven. You know, 30 seconds mm. is enough for some of these topics, but maybe not this topic here, as LeBron James has signed an extension with the Los Angeles Lakers, two years for as much as close to $100 million. So this year under contract, two more after that, a Laker for life now, as it appears, it seems. Hmm. Kevin, talk to us on LeBron James' extension with the Los Angeles Lakers. Yeah, whenever the most popular athlete in the country signs Uh, a multi-year extension, it's probably going to be a major story. But when you factor all of the circumstances around the Lakers, it is a big-time piece of news. Now, the money is unsurprising. I mean, what was he going to get? Underneath the max. It's LeBron James coming off of a season where he scored 30 points per game. Let's not be silly. It's what this means. It's what this implies, ultimately, about where the Lakers are going. The Lakers are going to play opening night against the Golden State Warriors on the road. Those lines are not out right now. Now, they could try and drop them for you, but I would never want to be in the room right now having to book a Lakers game for this coming season with the question marks that sit around it. There's a version of this Lakers roster that's backcourt is spearheaded by Austin Reeves and Russell Westbrook. I don't think that's going to inspire a lot of confidence to backers of this team. Or there's a version where Kyrie Irving rounds out a big three with LeBron and Anthony Davis. And Adrian Wojnarowski broke this story, beat Shams by 60 seconds, if that. But Woj also had some additional reporting about what this means, saying that the Lakers have actually grown increasingly willing to include both of their future first-round picks in a potential Kyrie Irving deal with the Brooklyn Nets which is a massive development. The idea has been that the Nets were going to hold serve and they would not move Kyrie until they were able to get both of those picks. Now, some might say, ah, the Nets are clearly not interested. Otherwise, this deal would be done. But we have told people constantly that trade does not happen until everything with Kevin Durant is figured out. But once that is figured out, and I still believe it will be, first call is Kyrie to... The Lakers. That's my expectation, which all of the sudden DRS should put all of the Lakers' futures odds on the move. Here we go. And also a three-year deal. Maybe that puts him in the strike zone for actually playing with his dream would be his son, Bronny, coming into the NBA. But let's take a look at those odds moves and if anything is going to move. Obviously, most of us thought that LeBron James was going to sign the extension. But talk about the odds market here. 18-1 to to win an NBA championship, to win the Western Conference 8-1, to and a win total of 45 and a half. Anything change your opinion here on the outset or the outlook, I should say, for the Lakers season? So the really interesting thing is that win total checking in at a 45 and a half. This is, again, a a Lakers team where the conversation last year for so many was, this is a bad roster, this is a bad roster, this is a bad roster. I'm not saying there wasn't some truth to that, but I think it was a little more complicated. Radio audience is here, by the way. On a Thursday morning, Kevin Walsh and Donnie Wright side of the early line on Sirius XM Channel 159. The Lakers roster was not ideal, but the main problem was health. LeBron ultimately didn't qualify for the scoring leaderboard, and Anthony Davis didn't qualify for anything with the amount of time that he missed. The only healthy member of their big three was Russell Westbrook. The year before, Donnie, right, where it was a down season for the Lakers, Remember, they were the seventh seed eliminated by the Phoenix Suns. Anthony Davis, again, battled a number of injuries. LeBron missed time with injuries himself. 42 and 30, almost nearly at that number. And the year where the Lakers won the title, they were 52 and 19. And again, that's only 71 games. If the Lakers are able to bring in a Kyrie Irving, that provides them the insurance that we at once... mm, I don't know how many people thought, but some suggested Russell Westbrook could provide them for when LeBron misses some time, 
when Anthony Davis misses some time. And let's be honest, if Kyrie Irving is there, when Kyrie misses some time. But if you're the Lakers, and on a consistent basis, you have two out of the three available, you're hoping most nights all three are there, but you can send two out of three there every single night, you are in a great situation to go over 45 and a half wins, plus Donnie, title odds, 18 to 1, those are cut in half, if not more. Western Conference Finals odds, 8 to 1, similar story, cut in half, if not more. And also, quick topic here. Five teams with a league-high 15 back-to-back games with the schedule release. But the NBA owners, Kevin, they'll tell us, these guys should be playing as much as possible, but then you do this to them consistently. Where is the consistency here with that? It is a little surprising. that 15 back-to-backs feels like a ton of games to be on a back-to-back. But one thing I have to admit, put a little quick smile on my face. The LA Clippers on that list. It's not because I hate the Clippers, but it. So I already now know there's 15 games Kawhi Leonard is on uh, ineligible for. But I also believe they asked Ty Lue yesterday, "Hey, you think Kawhi's back to start the season, Don?" And they told him, "We'll see." Yeah, we'll see about that. We'll see about preseason football coming up next. Pharrell, coast to coast. I don't care if they play this game in Puerto Rico. I mean, the bottom line is, it doesn't matter Seattle (laughs) or Anaheim, Robbie Ray's stuff has been beautiful all season long. He's gotten stronger. He's led the majors in innings, what, the last two, three years. The guy's an inning eater. He's going to go out and do his job. He's going to go out and get into the seventh inning tonight, and he's going to strike out and go over. He's going to get another nine or ten tonight. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. Donnie, in this AP Top 25, what caught your eye? Yeah, if we're looking just at, you know, the old guard, right, which particularly pertains to the S- excuse me, SEC, Alabama number one, Georgia number three, Texas number six. So three teams in the SEC in the top six. Wouldn't shock us again, Kevin, right? Two teams out of the final four will end up being from SEC competition. Notre Dame at number five. Only on SportsGrid. Pro Football Doc has found its new home right here with Sports Injury Central. And with that comes our expansion into other sports. Sports Injury Central will give you nonstop exclusive injury analysis from experienced team doctors from all three major sports. Doctors with resumes that include teams like the Chicago Bulls, the Texas Rangers, and the LA Chargers. So gain a fantasy DFS and betting edge right now for free at SICscore.com. The morning after. Well, the Niners have a better overall year than those two other teams being the Jags and the Jets. You know, it's funny. Is I think you'd get a lot of people, though you, you make a good point about where the number would sit. I think you'd get a lot of people to bet the Niners. I'm high on the Niners. I still would take the combination. I'm low on the Jets. I know I'm probably walking into a real bad trap here, and I'm going to live with it. I am very optimistic about the Jacksonville Jets. The Sports Grid Network. Fantasy Sports Today. Definitely a starter in every fantasy football league. He's a top 12 quarterback in fantasy, but no longer the thought process where I guess he could be a number two, the you know, second overall quarterback or the third. Remember in years past, he was being drafted right after the first couple of quarterbacks, but no longer the case. He's kind of like a consolation prize as opposed to the main starter for a lot of people. The Sports Grid Network. Diamond Bets. Fernando Tatis Jr getting popped for a PED suspension for 80 games. Now, uh, I know performance-enhancing drugs are something that, you know, even here at the network, they encourage us, especially myself. They say, please, can you enhance your performance just a little bit more, Joe? <laughs> year, it's not going to happen next year for a good chunk of the season. And guess what? This is more important now that you added Juan Soto. So, obviously, this news rocked Major League Baseball. Only on Sports Grid.
preseason preview time here on the early line. I don't know why we're doing only one Thursday game. Very on to me. Can we get that complaint out of the way? I have a feeling you'll agree. Why are we doing a standalone Seahawks-Bears game tonight? What's that about? All eyes. You want all eyes on Seattle tonight here, K-Dub. That's why. Primetime games. Don't mess with primetime games. You let them stand center stage. Now, hold, now, now, since when do you pass on the opportunity to slander bad schedule making? I've never seen because, that before I, from you. I th- because I think you wanted me to slander it, so me being the co-host going, no, I'm not going to give in to Kevin's yeah. demands this morning here on a Thursday. I'm going to go the opposite direction, the same way that you might hear me talking about, sure, watch out for them Steelers and Mitch Trubisky, pal. Don't, don't, don't poke the bear now. Don't. <laughs> oh, man, if I really get to back you into that corner, it would just be an absolute treat. It would be an easy one we'll put up on the board. Uh, here's the starting point. Mm-hmm. Seahawks are a three-and-a-half-point favorite. But I, we have to talk about the total. 40 and a half, it is down to a flat 40. But again, th- we'll, we'll talk about the game. The fact that that total, though, is a 40, how much of that is a reaction from every game going over in week number one? How much of that is, oh, well, the starters are supposed to be out there more. It means there's going to be way more points. Combination of both, it really is, because you're looking at the ebbs and flows of the NFL, which typically week one is usually an ugly product. A lot of 16 to 11s, you know, a lot of bad quarterback play, fourth quarters where teams are just looking to get in and get out and not get anybody injured. But now we're anticipating in a three-week preseason, Kevin, week two being that dress rehearsal, so maybe a cleaner game script. And also taking a look at teams like the Bears and the Seahawks, particularly the Seahawks, still have a quarterback competition up in the air. So you feel you're going to get your best foot forward, at least from one of those teams but I think you're right there we saw a lot of scoring in the first week that might continue in the week two and the books are bracing for that for me though this is this stuff always kind of has to have a middle point right we talk about oh these teams haven't played in a while it's going to be a lot of rust and I'm almost like but why is that why is the defense never rusty why are people not running wide open right we're now kind of going the other direction or oh the starters are playing yeah the defensive starters are are as well. It's not just the offensive starters. Yeah. I wonder if the Bucks gone a little bit too far here. The Chicago Bears were one of the main unders of that opening slate, a 19-4 game against the Kansas City Chiefs. Seahawks played their game against Pittsburgh, went well over the total 32-25. Here's another jumping off point, though, for you, Donnie. How much Geno Smith are we getting here? Is this yeah. quarterback room just Geno Smith and Jacob Eason? Because I am sure their plan was another full half of Geno, full half of Drew Locke, but kind of flip around the the timing of it all. But you don't have Drew Locke this week. I'm sure there's still stuff you want to see from Geno Smith. Do you need the full half? Where do you think the Seahawks land in terms of how they divvy up the playing time in the quarterback room? Obviously, we know that you know, the starter in this game is going to be Geno Smith. So from a betting perspective, if you know you're going to get a clean first half, or at least a first quarter, that's probably the way you lean with the Seahawks. But I think you bring up an interesting point because it's not so much a quarterback competition tonight, but the same way that you would view and say, all right, well, let's just say there wasn't a quarterback competition and it's week two in the preseason. How long did you want your starter, which would be Geno Smith, to play? Does he got to play a full half, three quarters in this game to get ready for the season? Because every NFL team will say to you, regardless of winning in the preseason, how healthy do you escape the preseason when you're ready for week one? Mm -hmm. So now if we're looking at the Seattle Seahawks where Geno Smith is the starter, is this one where boy, we might have played him a half and gave Drew Locke a half, or at least until some of these guys heated up. But we can't afford to lose Geno Smith now also because, number one, of practices, which you know Drew Locke's not going to be around, it hasn't been around with COVID here, but also moving forward. You can't lose Geno Smith at this point. We have a question mark on Drew Locke. And if you think Geno Smith now is the upper hand to be your starting quarterback week one, he can't play all that long tonight, can he? Outside of the normal quarter, quarter and a half that you would expect. That's the thing, though, is it's now a quarterback room that's just down to two men, with Eason being the other guy. Are we going to do three full quarters of Jacob Eason? Sounds like a lot, but you might, but you're doing at least a full half of Jacob Eason, and that is a big-time change from last week where he didn't play at all. So again, I look at this total. I think this might lean a little more under here to start week number two of the preseason. Do you... 
Are you moved at all by this, though, these lines here? Do you agree with me on an underlook? Are you more jumping off with a side here? Back Seattle at home. The Bears are terrible. How do you see this game here from a betting angle? Yeah, it's, it's hard to try to put your, you know, projections for a regular season into a preseason, which means, like, ah, oh, Bears think on offense, not going to move it, so easy to take the under 40. And quite frankly, a Geno Smith-led Seattle Seahawks often doesn't light up the room either when you talk about some of the other offenses, players, and quarterbacks around the NFL. So I would be with you in leaning towards an under 40 because once you get through Geno Smith and Justin Fields, by the way, is, is Justin Fields even playing tonight? I assume he is at this point. I didn't see anything where I'm trying to handicap yeah. the game where he's sitting out. So he's going to probably get his quarter. Both of these teams don't really enamor me at this point. So the under probably makes sense. But just from a betting perspective, you're right. If I'm looking at Geno Smith, who, again, the front office here, the coaching staff, is going to put their best foot forward, as I like to say, with that Geno Smith start to say, let's give him some opportunities here to try to extend his lead over Drew Locke mm -hmm. if Drew Locke is not going to be the quarterback and not keep it all that vanilla. But I don't know what I'm getting out of Eason for a half or three quarters of football mm -hmm. here. So I would look towards the under. But also, if you're betting the Seahawks, probably a first half bet on the Seahawks might make a little bit of sense. Understandable there. Uh, let me... Let me ask you this here, because, you know, with this being a standalone game, you have two coaches in very different spots, right? Pete Carroll mm -hmm. has been in Seattle forever. Matt Eberflus just arrived in Chicago. Yet I don't feel like this is a ridiculous question. Maybe you'll think it is. Are both of these coaches on the hot seat coming into this year? Eberflus can't be on the hot seat coming into this year, but Pete Carroll, he's been on the hottest seat in the world coming into the season, which we thought it would have been the perfect time. Oh, you moved on from Russell Wilson and your entire defense. You yeah, have about the old man in the room, Pete Carroll. Time to move on as well. Not the case there. So one would think that, you know, nine lives for Pete Carroll might be up this year, but I can't imagine. If Eberflus is on the hot seat, that would be tremendous stuff where I don't even know what the direction of the Chicago Bears would be if it doesn't work out with Eberflus this year. The thing, because the implication there, and you didn't bat an eye, is Pete Carroll's seat is there is no seat. It's burnt to ashes. He's just standing until the season is over, right? Things around the Bears just feel so off to me right now. If they're four and 13, I don't think you'd bat an eye at it, right? I mean, the win total is five and a half, so it's not that far off. I mean, like, if they're 4-13, and 13, are you promising me that Matt Eberflus gets another chance to run it back? No, I'm not. I don't know. Like, that was the one hire where people were like, what are we, what are we doing here? What's that all about? I don't see it. The, and I don't know how much you want to keep spinning the wheels there for Justin Fields. I know Eberflus is on the defensive side of the ball, but you'd imagine they fire Eberflus, new head coach, says, let me pick my offensive coordinator. It's just... I'm starting to get worried about Justin Fields' long-term prospects there because as we've talked about, it's about the situation you land in, and this just does not feel like a good one. No, it doesn't, and nothing matches up here because when you have a young franchise guy, your best foot forward, as the word of the day would be, is to help him out. Get him wide receivers. Get him a boy genius who's connected to Sean McVay that could sort of turn around the program. Mm -hmm. But it just seems like so much is up in the air. And also, Matt Eberflus, right? When you say, like, when you hire a coach for your franchise and you say to yourself, well, what's going to fire up the fan base and give us the best shot at winning? There was a time on this show, probably late April, when you're winding down with, you know, college basketball just ending and baseball picking up. Hey, head coach in the NFL, who's the Bears head coach? You know, who is the Bears head coach? That shows you what type of pick you made as a head coach. It is uh, one of our favorite sneaky pieces of trivia where we believe that you can take most people, you'll watch them go 31 of 32 on name yes. that head coach and just full swing and a miss coming when you ask them who is coaching the Chicago Bears. It will be Eberflus tonight, next preseason. Who knows? Baseball preview is next. The morning after. LSU has the same odds to win the SEC at 100 to 1 as they do to win a national championship, also 100 to 1. 
Well, I'll say this. There are going to be a lot of really bad takes about year one head coaches and a lot of people jumping to conclusions because there are eight, there are eight programs who have played in a national championship in the 21st century who have a first year head coach. That includes Virginia Tech because technically they played in a national championship in the first week. The Sports Grid Network. Sports Grid, your 24-7 sports wagering network. They play less games. The early line. Take a look at the top four seeds here in the Big Ten. They're going to play Aaron less Rogers games. And the morning the after. Wilson. We saw movement in the marketplace like Orlando. Fantasy Magic. Sports the Today. The Cavaliers are a little thin as well. Newswire. Minus 160 favorite on the money line today for Arizona. Pharrell and coast to coast. That's where they win cups. They win Stanley Cups over there. Give me the Game pass. time decision. Kind of bizarre when you consider it. Like so everybody is out for the Warriors. In game, live, I all like access. Vandy. I like Vandy against Bam. I think Vandy can win the game, take the four and a In half. game, oh, live, man. prime oh, yeah, time. The major, the PGA champion. In yes. game, live, overtime. All done before the final bet. Get the game. winning edge only on Sports Grid. The early line. And if we just take a look at the rushing numbers, right, 1,100 yards is the benchmark for us. Well, last year as a rookie, Kevin, we just talked about Dalvin Cook. He can never stay healthy. How about a rookie playing all 17 weeks last year with Big Ben Roethlisberger and the Steelers? How about him getting 307 rushing attempts as a rookie? I thought we were led to believe also the Pittsburgh Steelers where, yeah, we're about winning games, but we don't just hand things over to guys that get drafted and are drafted Only high. on Sports Grid. Fantasy Sports Today. Uh, Ezekiel Elliott declines even more and loses, let's say, 15% of the touchdowns and of the yards. He's being drafted way too high in fantasy this year. I mean, the people, the, I guess Ezekiel Elliott supporters will point out, well, you know, before he suffered the injury last year, sprained, uh, I want to say his MCL, but I'm not, uh, don't remember specifically, but it was a knee injury. Before the injury, yes, he was good. But it was four games into the season. The Sports Grid Network. Preview time here on the early line. Rockies Cardinals at it once again here in St. Louis. The Cards looking to handle their business and keep the Milwaukee Brewers at bay. It's an early start. Wainwright's got the ball. Total up from seven and a half now, eight on the FanDuel Sportsbook. So early movement here we're seeing on this baseball game. Is that movement that you're agreeing with? I do agree with it. I also agree with the St. Louis Cardinals being a minus 240 price in this game because yesterday cashing in on a run line for the Cardinals. I look for much more of the same coming today for the Cardinals on a run line. Minus 114 price to lay that minus one and a half. Wayne Wright's been decent. Exit around four, Kevin, over the past month, but really some good splits between lefties and righties. Wayne Wright being a right-handed pitcher. Lefties here, 275 weighted on base percentage with an ISO of 100. Right-handed batters, a 276 weighted on base percentage with an ISO of 148. But if you look at that St. Louis lineup today, once again, for seven batters in that lineup versus right-handed pitching, Kevin, take a look at some of these weighted on base percentages. 399, 327, 429, 408. 352, 354, and 369. Sensatella also struggling over the past month or so against right-handed bats to the tune of a 394 weighted on base percentage. The Cardinals should win. The Cardinals should win easy today. Run line should be a nice play for those Cardinals. How about that? And I don't feel that very often you line up a run line as well. Yes. Right? Sometimes, yeah, parlay piece, team total, first five. Yep. So, that stands out to me, doing these breakdowns with you uh, every single day there. Minus 113 right now on that Cardinals run line. Very palatable price, certainly, uh, at that number. So something to keep our eye on. Wainwright 
versus Sentinzella. Game gets our slate going at a little past one, which is great because we'll be able to watch a lot of this game together then on Moneyline, 1 p.m. Eastern start time there, so make sure you're hanging out with us as DRS looks like he could be involved early. We move forward to Donnie's least favorite series in the history of Major League Baseball. This one sort of accidentally found its way onto the slate here. It's White Sox Astros, Lucas Giolito versus Louis Garcia. Slight number on Houston on the road, eight and a half total. Where's the value in this game? Yeah, the one thing that Kevin is lucky on today that we actually don't have a full slate of Major League Baseball games because at right around 5 a.m. when I punch up what games are going to go into this rundown, I looked at this one and I said to myself, you know what? Let's skip this because it'd be a fun part of the show. And then I know how angry Kevin gets that we leave out the Houston-Chicago White Sox game. And here we are. So simple analysis of this game. Two good baseball teams, yes. Two good pitchers. But quite frankly, these pitchers match up very well against these lineups. So if we're looking overall at a hard-fought playoff-type scenario game, I'm going under between these two ball clubs today with the Astros and the Chicago White Sox. How about that? Each guy for 5Ks. Try and break it down a little bit there. Yeah. Minus 103 as well. I don't know about going over their five and a half. It leans over. I don't love over. But, again, a little you know, uh, parlay there would not be bad. Who knows? Maybe the FanDuel Sportsbook will find themselves on the boost board again. Involving some of these pitchers there. We uh, had some success with that earlier in the week. Uh, it was four different guys, five-plus Ks. So that worked out. We'll see again uh, if that's something that jumps off of the page. The Dodgers and the Brewers are going to button it up here now. There are certain times where I have to jump ahead of Donnie online for the analysis because there are things that are going to jump off of the page. To me. Easy now. There are going to be things that jump off of the page to me, but then you can kind of correct course here. And I know it's going to be really ridiculous that I'm going to say I am surprised to see the Dodgers as a favorite, but dang it, I am surprised to see the Dodgers as a favorite. They were willing to post Milwaukee and Brandon Woodruff as a favorite in this series. Corbin Burns can't get favorite status over Andrew Heaney? Now, hold on a minute. That feels maybe like some value against the Los Angeles Dodgers. Am I losing my mind? You're not losing your mind because if we're just trying to look at the optics of the game. Now, hold on here. Andrew Heaney, last time I remember him for the Angels, wasn't a good pitcher. Now he winds up on the other L.A. team. But again, the whole situation for the Dodgers this year continues to come down for at least me is no matter who they send out there, Kevin, on the mound, it seems like they have a chance to dominate. Now, get this. We always joke, or at least I joke about the Milwaukee Brewers lineup. They just can't hit, right? They've actually had some pretty good splits against right-handed pitchers. But over the last 30 against against lefties, this is a completely different story. Let's just focus here on the Milwaukee Brewers and their lineup right now. If we look at the nine that's coming into play tonight, there are two guys in this lineup, McCutcheon and Hera, that have weighted on base percentages above a 325. And quite frankly, they're elevated. McCutcheon's a 421, and Hera is a 400. So those two guys should be able to hit left-handed pitching. But now let's break down Andrew Heaney and what makes sense. XFIP numbers for the past 30 days, they're not great, Kevin. A 4.08. How about the K prop here? Striking at about 29% of the batters, which is very good. Now, if we look at lefty on lefty here for Heaney, he's faced 16 batters. They've crushed him. A weighted on base average of 420. But look at the lineup anticipated tonight for the Milwaukee Brewers. One lefty in the lineup, and that's Yelich, which means eight right-handed batters. Here's the reason why the Dodgers should be favored in this game. Heaney, over the past month, he's a lefty. He's faced 51 right-handed batters. Weighted on base percentage, 215. ISO power number, 044. So there's a reason to believe that my lineup, talking about the Dodgers, is better than your lineup, talking about the Brewers, and maybe a closer pitching matchup than one might see just from the eye. But if I'm looking at the game overall, a common theme this afternoon, Kevin, instead of taking a side in this one, I think the game stays under. How about that? I'll say this on Heaney. It's a really interesting season he's put together so far overall. Seven starts for the Dodgers, a 1.16 ERA. Two starts in April, none in May, one in June, one in July. But now he's made three in August, and we're starting to see some of that consistency. And again, just from the outsurd, you know, sub .5 ERA he was pushing, you're seeing a little more of that vulnerability. Also, Heaney does not go all that long into baseball games here. 
His high pitch mark uh, in that month of August is 81. He went only three innings in his last outing against the Kansas City Royals. So we'll see how it matches up here all in all. But you think that perhaps the number makes some sense. That 7.5 total could very well end up checking towards the under. Cubs O's is a big series. The Baltimore Orioles now have a chance to be favored in all of these games that you would see against the Chicago Cubs, assuming this is not just a singular makeup, because I know that this first game, that is just a singular makeup. That is a shame. I thought they might be starting anew here in Baltimore. Well, then just the one game is important for Baltimore. Watkins has the ball. Totals a nine. Samson on the mound for the Cubbies. How do you see this one playing out? It actually, the, the batters actually match up decently against these pitchers. If we take a look at the Chicago Cubs going up against Watkins, who's a right-handed pitcher, they've hit righties fairly well over the past month. But having said that, Watkins has been very good against both lefties and righties with his splits. If we flip it over and take a look at Sampson here, XFIP is a little bit high at a 4.3, but he also, through left-handed batters, has dominated them. A 285 weighted on base percentage and an ISO power of 106. Why is that important? Looks like we're going to have Mullins, Rutschman, Santander, Varvra, and Odor as lefties, which would be more than the majority of the lineup. Five lefties to four right-handed batters. Samson has struggled a little bit with right-handed batters, though, particularly over the last month, Kevin. A 379 weighted on base percentage and an ISO power number of 222. But as we see there at the FanDuel Sportsbook, that price around a nine for a total. Again, get used to this theme. I like the under this afternoon down at Camden Yards. Low scoring baseball is the expectation. Baltimore here, though, with this quick game against Chicago. And then they're going to play Boston for home uh, for three. Then it's the White Sox for three, the Astros for three, and the Guardians for three. So not that, you know, we're at this point of the year. How many easy games do you see? We knew that that their schedule in Baltimore uh, playing in the AL East was going to be difficult, but those are a lot of non-AL East matchups that look difficult early here for the O's. Diamondbacks, Giants, it's an early start if you're out on the West Coast. It's midday here for those on the East Coast. Logan Webb against Zach Gallen. Gallen, typically uh, the lone Arizona starter that you, you see get some respect in the market, and I, I think that's Matching up here, it's only minus 146 for the San Francisco Giants. Another low, low total of a seven. Is that where your eye is drawn again? That's where the eye is going to be drawn again here, Kevin, as we take a look at Webb on the mound. Last 30 days, a 3.73 XFIP number. Weighted on base percentage of lefties, a 314 to righties, a 248. If we flip that over to Zach Gallen, a 3.05 XFIP number over the past 30 days. But how about these splits, Kevin? 67 batters he's faced from the left-hand side, a 189 weighted on base percentage, and an ISO of zero. 1-7 to right handed batters, 48 that he's faced, a 174 weighted on base percentage, and an 043 ISO. Maybe a live dog in this game would be Arizona, but again, more comfortable. It takes eight runs to beat me. That's the way I'm going. Zach Gallen right now pitching to that sub-3 ERA for the season here, just 27 years old. The kind of guy that if you're the Arizona Diamondbacks, you are hoping – you can keep for a long time. He's had success against the Giants this year. Not a ton of action, only 11 and two-thirds inning, but good enough for a 2-3-1 ERA in that there. The Giants are a team that currently sit just one game above 500, and it does feel like so much of the shine has been taken off of this group. You can talk about last year, the best record in all of baseball, holding off the Dodgers, winning the NL West. But it is just five and a half games right now that they sit off of the San Diego Padres. Six games, if you want to include the Phils, who are in that second spot. The number is big. The Giants have deep odds when we're talking about making the postseason. However, it is not an insurmountable range. These are the games that make the difference. I know Zach Gallen is not a pushover, but if you're the San Francisco Giants, you had a four-game set here with the Diamondbacks, you dropped one yesterday, it has to be three wins in your back pocket before you then go and play Colorado for three. Big stuff coming up. More game preview coming up as well. All next. Sports Grid. 
your 24-7 sports wagering network. People are going to the betting window betting and betting them the now rim. before the trade takes place. How Diamond dare they bets. do what's fiscally responsible? See how it plays out. Buffalo's going all in right Football now. Football full need, circle. All their chips in the middle of the table. It's do or die. For and God being out. They, they've had a little bit of a shakeup. In-game live all access. You could take the points. You could take the money line. And we either go to San Jose to maybe a small player chance. I'm going to go both underdogs here. I don't want to hear it anymore. Wow. In game the Phillies here. It's prime minus time. 128. You do have to lay up a little bit of wood here, Donnie, but I think it gets Patrick Corbin. But boy, you want to give me eight and a half points with a desperate team facing elimination. Get the winning edge. Only on Sports Grid, your 24 7 sports wagering network. Maurice Allen. 2015-2016 European Long Drive Tour Champion, 2017 World Number One. Me personally, I keep my game face on me all the time. Especially coming out of the bunker, leaving the range, or even leaving the course. What's your story? Fantasy Sports Today. Definitely a starter in every fantasy football league. He's a top 12 quarterback in fantasy, but no longer the thought process where I guess he could be a number two, the you know, second overall quarterback or the third. Remember in years past, he was being drafted right after the first couple of quarterbacks, but no longer the case. He's kind of like a consolation prize as opposed to the main starter for a lot of people. The Sports Grid Network. The early line. Can Cease become the favorite in this market by the result of this baseball game? I don't think so, because we have to remind ourselves. This isn't, you know, Dylan Cease pitching to Justin Verlander, and that's the head-to-head matchup of who wins it gets the title belts, right? I mean, that's not, that's not the way it works here. You actually are taking a look at this game saying, how is Verlander going to do up against that Chicago White Sox lineup? How is Cease going to do against that Astros lineup? Only on Sports Grid. Diamond bets. Fernando Tatis Jr. getting popped for a PED suspension for 80 games. Now, uh, I know performance enhancing drugs are something that, you know, even here at the network, they encourage us, especially myself. They say, please, can you enhance your performance just a little bit more, Joe? <laughs> year, it's not going to happen next year for a good chunk of the season. And guess what? This is more important now that you added Juan Soto. So obviously, this news rocked Major League Baseball. Only on Sports Grid. Live on a Thursday morning, about 20 minutes to go here and still a ton of baseball that we are set to preview. The Red Sox and the Pirates continuing their series. Looks like this will be finishing up today here. Brew Baker has the ball against Wikinowski. Totals an eight and a half, man. The Boston Red Sox just no juice about this team, right? Like usually they play the Pittsburgh Pirates and you think to yourself, ah, this feels like a mismatch here. These guys feel right in line. And I'm seeing you smile over there. I mean, if you yeah. think that guy's name you is not me. Wickenowski, I mean, you, you got to be kidding me. I mean, what? I do like the fact I mean, what's that the deal? bad pitchers do deserve to have their name slandered, but Wickenowski, let's roll with that. So Wickenowski on the mound today, the right the pitcher. Go hold on, hold on a minute it should now. should be what? Winkowski, right? How do you have Wickenowski? Yeah, I... W-I-N-C-K. Winkowski. Yeah, there's a couple right? extra letters in there, the way, they, the way they spell it over on my screen there. Anyway, Josh W. against J.T. Brubaker. <laughs> I mean, tell me the story of this game. Yeah, one of those, we started, went on a run of games. We're like, under, 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 under. I think we could finally change one up here between the Red Sox and the Pittsburgh Pirates. Why? Just because those pitchers aren't very good. Winkowski, 6.28 XFIP over the past 30 days. K percentage under 10%. But how about this, Kevin? Lefty and righty splits. Lefties, a 400 weighted on base percentage. Righties, 
a 385. So maybe he's not giving up that many power at bats here, Kevin. Not the case. Left-handed ISO power number, 205. Right-handers, a 313. But if you do look at the lineup, it is really lacking for the Pittsburgh Pirates. So maybe they could get a jump on a bad pitcher. If we flip it over to Brubaker, his XFIP not as bad as Winkowski, but looking at about a 3.8. Decent strikeout percentage, decent walk right here. But get this. Take a look at his right-handed, left-handed splits. Keep in mind, Brubaker is a right-handed pitcher. To lefties, a 403 weighted on base percentage with an ISO of 244. Right-handed batters, Kevin, 431. I think the ability to get runs today in Pittsburgh makes some sense. Finally a game we might be able to get some scoring on. All right, that's what we're looking for. We need some juice here on this board. Mm -hmm. Now, Yankees, Blue Jays usually can provide some juice. Usually we view these as good lineups there. Yanks coming off of a 15-run baseball game. Now, did a ton of those runs come in extra innings? Yeah, almost all of them. But leave me alone. It was nice to see some scoring and it come from the Yankees' side of it. They're up against Barrios today, who's, I feel like, been a vulnerable pitcher throughout this season. How are you matching up New York and Toronto? The perfect splits here coming up from Monta, so you're going to like this one. Now, Jose Barrios hasn't been very good, so whether the Yankees continue and say, we got eight runs last night, let's do it again today, we'll find that out. But let's focus here on Frankie Montas getting the start here in the Bronx against the Toronto Blue Jays. A over 5 exit for the past month. Hasn't been good, Kevin. Strikeout percentage below 20%, not good enough. Walk percentage above 10%. So everything lining up right here doesn't really say, man, he might get lit today. Let's take a look at his splits. Matas, a right-handed pitcher, going up against a lefty. 36 plate appearances, Kevin. They've raked him here. A 522 weighted on base percentage. An ISO of 296. Oh, boy. If you can line up three, four, five guys from the left-hand side, you can get after Matas. But again... Looking at this lineup here for the Toronto Blue Jays, they are lacking in lefties. And today, it looks like the only guy, Jackie Bradley Jr., who's due to anticip or anticipated to hit out of the nine hole here. Everybody else from the right side. Why is that important with Frankie Montas? Take a look at this. 41 batters Kevin he's faced over the past 30 days from the right side, a 244 weighted on base percentage, and an ISO of 108. So pitching to strengths here for Frankie Montas, I think is going to make some success happen for those Yankees, particularly early in this game. Now, look, can he blow up? Sure. His exit numbers are high. I get that here. But I'm thinking I'm trusting Montas a little bit more than Barrios today. How about that? Well, from what we've seen this year, Barrios has made two starts in Yankee Stadium. Neither really has gone all too well. Earlier in the season, certainly, but still somewhat noteworthy there. Five innings, three earned runs uh, in April. And then back in May, five and a third inning, five earned runs, three home runs so far this year he's allowed. One of the interesting things to me with Frankie Montas, and I, I know you're providing us kind of the way he's matching up against guys recently yeah. here, but one of the selling points of the Montas trade to the Yankee backers is that, Montas has really good numbers against the Houston Astros, which is relevant. But also, how is he against the Toronto Blue Jays? Not a lot of at-bats against these guys. Most of them three or less. But there are two hitters in this lineup, just long-term outlook, that have seen him double-digit times. George Springer, 13 for a 308 batting average. And how about good old Whit Merrifield, 16 times. A clean 500 batting average against Frankie Montas here. These were the starts that Montas was brought in for. Look, he got off easy, right? Compared to maybe a Louis Castillo, who I know Seattle has Robbie Ray, but I feel like they're already hoping that Castillo is going to be their guy. The Yankees think that that's Garrett Cole. And then maybe it's Nestor Cortez. Montas has to be a super solid number three, but still has to be able to get the job done in a matchup like this against the Toronto Blue Jays. Moving forward, actually, you know what? I almost forgot I wanted to bring up one other point here. If you were going to fade the Yankees in the division, it would be right now, right? You'd bet the Blue Jays at 32-1 to and hope that this series goes the Blue Jays' way and that that 10-game lead could be approached being cut in half. Feels like now or never if the Blue Jays are going to make a legitimate push at this thing, right? 
Exactly. I mean, this is where you want to start also in New York, and you figure that you're going to be matching up with them once again, maybe a few times in the month of September. And who knows if the Yankees are even out of their doldrums at the plate, even though they pulled out that miracle win last night on a grand slam. So you're right. This would be the time to strike. All right. How about that? Let's uh, keep it here with New York, but we are in Atlanta. Jacob DeGrom against Max Fried. Now, Max Fried has got to be tired of this. Every time he goes out there, it's either Max Scherzer or Jacob DeGrom going up against him. I mean, could he get a Carlos Carrasco day, try and make his life a little bit easier? But you've got the Mets here at a minus 116. I don't know how many people are going to be scared about Jacob DeGrom at minus 116. Is that the right approach? I got to tell you, anytime Jacob DeGrom's on the mound, you're probably looking in that direction. But let's just take a look at some of these, you know, points here of why we would bet either side. If you're looking at just run scoring in this game, it looks like it's pretty going to be tough to come by. But is it one of those angles? Well, Max Reed's been on the IL and, you know, he had to get back from his concussion because that might weigh a little bit here on the Atlanta Braves side. Does he have that full arsenal of pitches, meaning can he go to 90 or 100 pitches today or is he cut short at 75 or 80? But if you look at the last 30 days, Kevin, and to take the snapshot of how good these pitchers have actually been, we just take a look at the lefty and righty splits here. We just waited on base percentages here. For Max Freed, a 182 to the lefties, which he's a lefty, and to righties, a 271. If we flip that over and take a look at Jacob DeGrom, a 126 to lefties, keep in mind DeGrom is a righty, and a 136 to right-handed batters. Now, the end-all, be-all typically is the ISO power number because how much power are these pitchers giving up? Take a look at Max Fried. To lefties, an 053. To righties, an 035. Lining up Jacob DeGrom, his power numbers against lefties and righties. How about the lefties, an 036, and to righties, a 111. I don't know where the baseball is going, but quite frankly, if he gets out of the infield, it would be impressive tonight. I'm leaning more towards an under in this game, but my goodness, it is just hard to pass up on Jacob DeGrom with what he's doing now and seemingly getting stronger every start. The last time he saw this team, he was perfect through five and two-thirds innings. He also struck out 12. Let me give a little insight here into kind of why for me, when I am betting strikeouts, this cannot all be projections, projections, projections. Donnie, again, the last time he went out there, he struck out 12 against the Braves. Mm -hmm. Against the Phillies, he struck out 10. The projections mm -hmm. tonight would tell you that this number is going to be around a 6.5, and, and you'd want to play under 7.5 or better. Madness. Insanity. You'd be out of your mind if they posted a 7.5 to do anything other than go over. And by the way, it's going to be a 9.5 probably with juice to the over. And he's probably going to hit it. Because, Donnie, what happens if Jacob DeGrom, oh, I don't know, is allowed to go seven innings for the first time? Yeah. Like, I, I started to think about this the other day when he did this against the Phils. Donnie, six innings, 10 Ks, 76 pitches. When we get to the playoffs here, right, and he's allowed mm -hmm. to throw 100 pitches and maybe complete games, I mean, are these strikeout props going to be like 12 and a half? For this guy? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. 15 is going to be the norm here for his strikeouts come playoff time. You're talking about in the playoffs, usually a quicker hook as well. But you're correct about that, which is the anomaly of his last pitching performance. You're not supposed to throw 76 pitches here and get, you know, 10 Ks at that point. That's way too efficient. Usually the 10 K games come from throwing 114 yeah. pitches because you're trying to strike guys out as opposed to 76 pitches. Sounds like you're pitching to contact at that point. That's what's amazing. He's 0-2 on every batter. They they just yes. start off 0-2, I am convinced, walking up to that plate. It's how it feels. Again, that strikeout prop number is not posted just yet, but the anticipation for me is a juiced 9.5 towards the over. The Padres welcome in the Nats. How about it? it mine, <sighs> yeah. Minus 390. Easy. Minus Easy. 390. It was minus 405. Now, I refuse to believe that that means that people are betting the Nationals at plus 320. Something else is, is abound there. But nevertheless, the number's on the move in the Nats direction. Well, how do we feel here about you? Oh, I already know. You Darvish versus Anibal Sanchez. Mm-hmm. The sign of a good franchise. Run out of pitcher that gives you absolutely zero percent chance yeah. at winning a ball game. That's what the Nationals are doing tonight. So notes say the Padres roll, but my goodness, I mean, talking about you know close to a four to one.
price there, a minus 405 price. We'll see where this one actually closes up. But this is probably one of the bigger mismatches that you're going to see during Major League Baseball season. Cy Young caliber pitcher versus a guy that should not be in the major leagues. And also, good for the Padres. A little jet lag, though, coming back from you know Miami all the way back to San Diego. You know what helps jet lag? San Anibal Sanchez on the mound. And yesterday, putting up double digits at the plate. This team lines up perfectly against Sanchez. If you're taking a look at some of these, you know, oh, let's take a home run shot. Juan Soto's 419 weighted on base percentage versus right-handed pitching over the last 30 days. Manny Machado, a 449. Even Travis Gresham, a 378. This team's going to hit early. This team's going to hit often. So maybe the safest play, instead of saying to yourself, do I think that the Padres will lose? No, I don't. But I think if the Padres win, they're going to light up Sanchez as well. Maybe a team total look might be the best effort here for the Padres if you want to bet the game. Over the last eight games, the Soto Machado hitter prop parlay has cashed in seven of them. It's minus 123 today. Machado with multiple hits in all eight of those baseball games. Donnie, how about this? To, to record two plus hits for Machado is plus 175. Look, there's, I know it's Anibal Sanchez. And, and, and by the way, he probably mm-hmm. will be able to cash that ticket. But if, if they start walking Machado, he might only register four at bats tonight. Well, you need a guy to bat 500 for night, but it's plus 175. It shows how hot Manny Machado is at the dish. To, for two plus bases, he's minus 130. One of the stronger numbers we've seen in that market there. It's just a game tonight where the expectations is the Padres can roll their best guy on the mound, Adebal Sanchez. The lineup is hot. But the Padres need it. They are not out of the woods yet in this NL wild card race. Need to put results up on the board against the Washington Nationals. That'll do it for me, but don't go anywhere. Make sure you listen up. Let's close it out next. early line. Donnie, in this AP Top 25, what caught your eye? Yeah, if we're looking just at, you know, the old guard, right, which particularly pertains to the S- excuse me, SEC, Alabama number one, Georgia number three, Texas number six. So three teams in the SEC in the top six. Wouldn't shock us again, Kevin, right? Two teams out of the final four will end up being from SEC competition. Notre Dame at number five. Only on Sports Grid. The morning after. LSU has the same odds to win the SEC at 100 to 1 as they do to win a national championship, also 100 to 1. Well, I'll say this. There are going to be a lot of really bad takes about year one head coaches and a lot of people jumping to conclusions because there are, eight, there are eight programs who have played in a national championship in the 21st century who have a first year head coach. That includes Virginia Tech because technically they played in a national championship in the first week. The Sports Grid Network. Your heart's racing. The clock's running out. It all comes down to this. We're talking pregame. 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 Get locked in with game time decisions. Your hosts, Gabe Marinci and Cam Stewart, will get you ready for game time. Everything you need to know before a game goes off the board with the best lips to back it up. Make your best bet with live odds updates, late breaking news, up to the minute injury reports, and real time analytics from inside the sports books. All the odds, all the action from sports wagering insiders and industry pros like Donnie Wrightside, Gam Lou, Cousin Sal, the pro football doc, Dr. David Chow, and more. Get the winning edge every weekday afternoon from 6 to 7 p.m. Eastern, 3 to 4 Pacific. It's game time decisions only on Sports Grid. Pharrell, coast to coast. The reality is, is that uh, what I'm hearing is Flacco's going to play that game against the Ravens in week one. And I'm just going to put like salt on this. Flacco's better than Zach Wilson anyway. I mean, he's better flat out anyway. Like all things being equal, he's head and shoulders better than. Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson sucks. And until he, I mean. 
the Sports Grid Network. Today here for the early line for a Thursday and a football Thursday here on the Sports Grid Network, Sirius XM Channel 159. Donnie Kevin in the morning is always carrying you through until the early line passes it over to the morning after. Let's have some fun with this topic today because you know me. I'm all about that bottom line. I'm all about dollars. And I know the best way forward for college football. So I'm going to say this. Listen up. Taking college football out of the NCAA's hands and placing it into a better entity. What are you, crazy, Donnie? How could you do that? Don't you remember all the years and years of college football pride that we got of the bowl system and having a number one versus number two that barely played each other to determine a national championship? Well, 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 we're starting to meet and we're unhappy talking about the college chancellors and presidents about what's going on and why we can't get an expanded playoff until after what, 2026? Everybody wants the expanded playoffs. And to the buffoons that say, well, it's only going to be Alabama and Clemson every year in Ohio State, enough with it here. Do you say the same thing about the NFL? It's only going to be the Kansas City Chiefs every year. No, you don't. We enjoy football. We like bigger games in bigger moments. And I'm going to say this until I'm blue in the face. Let me help you, NCAA. Put me in control. We will wipe the bowl season out completely. We will put in a 30-team playoff at a minimum. We will wipe out the cupcake schedules, and everybody will eat at the end of the year. More money in your pockets, college football guys. More fun in my pocket here, and a chance for gambling on my end of it. It's a win-win scenario. Take it away from the NCAA, cut the bowl system out, at least 30 teams in a playoff, and watch the dollars roll in and the excitement hit in NFL level. It only makes sense. Donnie Wrightside for Commissioner 2024. Who says no? I'll tell you right now who says no. Send it over to Ben Stevens here in the morning after. You got to be on the grid. Stay with us. 